Father in heaven, as we open your word again this afternoon, we pray that your blessing will be with us, enlighten our minds, and may the Holy Spirit be our teacher. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our seminar programs that we've conducted in this church, we've spent quite a bit of time in the book of Daniel. I've pointed out to you in, in the past, and I just make a quick repetition of it today, the book of Daniel has two main sections. One is we call the historical chapters, and the other is the section containing the prophetic chapters. <clears throat> what some people probably haven't noticed is that the historical chapters lead into the prophetic chapters. For example, in chapter 1 of Daniel, you have Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon coming up against Jerusalem, representative of uh, the non-believers attacking the believers. And this theme goes through the book of Daniel and into the prophetic chapters. The same thing is seen in the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. Uh, false religion attacking true religion. And that carries through into the prophetic chapters and so on. And one of the key words of the book of Daniel is the word deliverance. Make a note of it in your mind, and when you read through the book of Daniel one time, see how many times the word deliverance comes to light. You have deliverance from the fiery furnace. You have deliverance from the lion's den. In Daniel uh, uh, chapter 12, at that time thy people shall be delivered. See, because there you have the del earthly deliverances representing the great spiritual deliverance that will come at the end of time when God's people are delivered from those that would uh, seek to destroy them. Daniel also has in the prophetic section four great prophecies. And these prophecies have a characteristic that links them together. That link is that they constitute repetition and enlargement. The theme is repeated, repeated, each time a new prophecy comes along, and each prophecy, as it enlarges, as it is presented, enlarges on the ones that have gone before. In this way, we lock the, all these prophecies together and, and end up with a broader picture than if we just looked at one of them. We <clears throat> know a lot about Daniel 2 and the golden image, the uh, multi metal image, head of gold and chest of silver, and so on. And we know about the four beasts of Daniel 7, lion, the bear, the leopard, and the nondescript. In Daniel 8, we have the ram and the he-goat, and these beasts represent different nations. And uh, the theme comes through also. Horns representing powers and rulers and kings and so on uh, is also another feature of uh, Daniel. But when we come into Daniel chapter 11... 11 and 12 constitute the fourth great prophetic section. We find that it's not talking about beasts anymore. It just it comes out more in the open about nations and powers that would be. And Daniel 11 is not very, a very easy chapter to understand, and that's probably why we as Adventists and others as well uh, don't spend as much time in Daniel 11 as they do in some of the other chapters of the book. And why less is known of the interpretation of these. Now, if you want to get a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of Daniel chapter 11, I suggest you go to Uriah Smith's book, have a look at what he has to say, at the early part of it especially. I don't endorse everything that he had at the latter part, as we'll see this afternoon. But in the early part of Daniel 11, he has a very good rundown of what powers are represented, what kings and what individuals are represented as you go through Daniel chapter 11. Um, <clears throat> when we come to the latter part of Daniel 11, it uh, is not so clear because some of those things are not yet been fulfilled. And we have to be very careful... <coughs> when we're looking at prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled because we can come up with an idea as what, in what way they will be fulfilled and we may be wrong. 
because we cannot claim prophetic insight and infallibility when it comes to interpreting prophecies that are not yet fulfilled. So we have to be careful. But we look at them, we discuss them, and we may hold a position, but we must always remember that it should be held in a tentative position because we may be wrong. So many Adventists in the past have tried with the latter part of Daniel 11 to interpret the prophecies by looking at newspaper headlines. And I've warned about that before, haven't I? That we look at newspaper headlines and try and say that's the way the prophecy will be fulfilled. Uh, And then the headlines change and a different uh, set of circumstances comes up and we say, oh, we we have to revise our interpretation. And uh, it can be a bit embarrassing for some people. And some people haven't gone out on a limb, as we say, and not prepared to back down off it. And so they stubbornly stick to their original interpretation, even though the rest of the church has left them behind and nobody, very few people are supporting their position anymore. And we have some individuals like that in the church who have... uh, uh, gone in record in the past of an interpretation and then things didn't work out the way they thought they would and so they still don't want to admit they made a mistake so they keep on saying that's the interpretation. <coughs> have more to say about that perhaps in a little while. But let's open our Bibles to Daniel 11 because we're going to spend the first part of our program this afternoon in Daniel 11 and go through it in broad outline and look at some features that... Uh, where we can perhaps learn something or find something of interest. And then in the latter part of the prophecy, I want to take you into Revelation chapter 18, which is a very important chapter in the book of Revelation, and look at some aspects of the prophecy there. Daniel chapter 11 starts off with the kingdom of uh, uh, Medo-Persia. Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, Even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. The Medo-Persian Empire had already started. First year of Darius the Mede, so Cyrus was the emperor. And Darius was the local king in Babylon, put there by Cyrus. And he says there will yet stand up three more kings of Persia. And then later on it says, uh, talks about the realm of Greece, verse Two, last part. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king, verse 3, shall stand up. This mighty king is interpreted by most Bible scholars as Alexander the Great. We have in, of course, the prophecy of Daniel 8, the ram and the he-goat. But the he-goat had one notable horn, which it says was the first king, taken to be Alexander the Great. And when it was broken off, what came up in its place? Four. Four horns came up. This is Daniel 8. And these are taken to be the four divisions into which Alexander's empire broke up and divided after his death. His, His death was untimely. He was only in his early 30s, about 33 when he died. And uh, some people have drawn a comparison between the death of Jesus, about the same age as what Alexander was. Um, I don't want to labor that point too much today because Alexander was certainly, I don't believe, was a type of Jesus in any way. But um, it's just an interesting fact of history that they both died about the same age. Now, Alexander, his kingdom broke up into four. We have the two of these kingdoms. Well, the four generals that took over his empire were Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And uh, the two that are concerned mainly in the rest of Daniel chapter 11 are the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, known in the Bible as the king of the north and the king of the south. And uh, there is, I think, universal acceptance that when Daniel 11 talks about the king of the north in the early part of the chapter, he's talking about the Seleucids. And when he talks about the king of the south in the early part of the chapter, he's talking about the Ptolemies. And while the founders of these two kingdoms were both generals serving under Alexander the Great, they became enemies and their successors and successors waged wars against each other and fought against each other. And some of the conflicts that, are, that took place in history are predicted in this prophecy 
uh, in Daniel chapter 11. In verse 14, it's thought that pagan Rome is introduced. Verse 14, pagan Rome introduced. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south, also the robbers of thy people. It's thought that the expression, the robbers of thy people, is a reference to pagan Rome. And they shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. And then it says that the king of the north shall come and cast up a mound and take the most fenced cities and arms and so on. And it goes on to say that there would be a raiser of taxes. And what bell rings in your mind when you hear that expression? The birth of Jesus when Caesar Augustus made a law that all the world or his empire was to be taxed. And everybody had to go to their ancestral city to register for this taxation. And that forced Joseph and Mary to leave Galilee and head down to Bethlehem because he was of the house of David and that was the headquarters of David's clan, his family. And so he made the journey down there and that's how the prophecy was fulfilled that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, the raiser of taxes. Pagan Rome also, in verse 22 would do something against the prince of the covenant. Daniel 11, verse 22. And with the arms of a flood shall they overflow from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant, a reference to Jesus. So we come down here to the time of Augustus, who taxed the world, and uh, that's in verse 20. And then the... uh, dealing with the Prince of the Covenant, (coughs) mentioned in verse 22. (coughs) Pagan Rome, of course, as we know, was followed by Papal Rome. The little horn of Daniel 7 gives us a picture of that, and the horn had waxed exceeding great, representing both Pagan and Papal Rome in chapter 8 of Daniel. And uh, that is the topic that we've looked at uh, before. The coming of Papal Rome is thought to commence in verse uh, 30. Ships of Chittim are mentioned. And because the work that this power was to do parallels, very closely parallels, the wording that we find in chapter 8 and 9 about the horn power treading down the sanctuary, representing the work of Papal Rome, as we have studied in previous occasions the work of papal Rome. Notice this, verse 31, and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, the King James Version says the daily sacrifice. The word sacrifice is in sloping print, if you notice in the King James Bible, which means that it is a supplied word. In the original language, the word sacrifice is not there. It just says, taking away the tamid. What is the tamid? The word tamid actually means continual, that which was continual. And when you examine this word in the Pentateuch, particularly, you find that the word is used repeatedly of the sanctuary. The tamid incense that was to burn. The tamid lights that were to burn, the continual light burning. The tamid showbread that was there. The tamid altar sacrifices, morning and evening sacrifices, that which was done continually in connection with the sanctuary. And so to take away the tamid is a reference to the taking away from men and women the knowledge of what these sacrificial systems and what the incense burning and what all the other ceremonies of the sanctuary really means. They were all types and shadows of what? The ministry of Jesus in heaven. And this power was to take away from men and women the knowledge of Christ's priestly ministry. And we know for a fact that the apostasy that took place during the Middle Ages hid from men and women the knowledge of what Jesus is doing in the heavenly sanctuary. I've got a list of about that long, almost a sheet of A4 paper full of all the substitutes that have been made over the centuries. Uh, For example, instead of the high priestly ministry of Jesus being looked to, they looked to the earthly priest. 
Instead of the once for only sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, they look to the sacrifice of Jesus repeatedly done when every time a Mass is said. Because every time a Mass is said in a Catholic church, Christ is being re-sacrificed. Which, of course, is contradiction to what we have in the book of Hebrews, where it says, one sacrifice for sins forever. The sacrifice of Jesus never had to be repeated. It was only one sacrifice forever. But in Catholic theology, every time a Mass is said, Jesus is being re-sacrificed. Although there is no blood spilt when you have a Mass said, yet they take the wine as representing the blood, the real blood, they say. And they say that the body, the, the bread, becomes the real body of Christ in the um, platonic way of looking at things. Now, the verses here talk about the taking away of the daily, the treading down of the, and the abomination of desolation that would be set up, and so on. And uh, it also talks about the persecution that would uh, happen, that would follow the establishment of this uh, power. They that understand them among the people shall instruct many. Yea, they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. And that's a parallel thought to what we have in the earlier chapters of Daniel. We have a time, time and half a time of papal supremacy. Many days. Wear out the saints of the Most High, persecuting God's people. Here it is in Daniel 11 uh, being outlined for us again. And some of them shall understand, shall fall and to try them, and to purge them, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is at the time, yet for a time appointed. Now, in verse 36, we come to something really interesting. If you go to Uriah Smith's book, as I referred to a while ago, when he gets to verse 36, instead of following on, Enlarging on the previous visions of Daniel, Uriah Smith interpreted verse 36 as referring to a totally different power, totally new power. He said verse 36 to verse 39 spoke about revolutionary France. Now, we don't mean anything about revolutionary France as such in the earlier chapters of Daniel. And so you could argue that uh, he was... uh, enlarging on the vision. But now, was he really enlarging correctly when he interpreted it in this way? Or was it something that he was uh, looking at because of the newspaper headlines at the time? <clears throat> You'll find it in his book. It's still there in the book. You get a book of the thoughts of Daniel and Revelation. Read it up. It's uh, Revolutionary France in verse 36 to 39. And to jump ahead to verse 40 to 45, he introduced Turkey as the king of the south. Well, I'll say some more about that when we get to it, but I want to first of all spend some time here in verse 36 to 39 and clear up uh, some aspect here. Uriah Smith said that this referred to revolutionary France. He said, verse 36, when it said, the king shall do according to his will, He did not believe that was referring to the power that was discussed in the previous verses, which is clearly the the papal power. When it says, the king, oh, he said that has to be something different because king of the north, king of the south, and so on. Now, they haven't been mentioned for a while because once uh, you come down into the Roman period, the king of the south, the king of the north are no longer mentioned. It's pagan Rome and then papal Rome. King of the Seleucids and the Ptolemies are gone. So the king, he said, was uh, revolutionary France. He shall do according to his will, and he shall magnify himself and exalt himself above every god, shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. When you look at those words, it sounds very much like we read in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and 9. Parallel, the work of the papacy speaking great words against the Most High. Let me read it again. He shall magnify himself above every god, shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. And there, I think, is a key. That last phrase I read, to me, is the key to show that Uriah Smith missed the point in his interpretation. Because revolutionary France did not prosper till the end of time. Revolutionary France was like a flash 
in history and disappeared. Revolutionary France has not been around for centuries. Long time. But this power that the king that's spoken about here in verse 36, it says it was to prosper till the indignation be accomplished. That is, till the end of time, the second coming. Revolutionary France did not prosper that long. So I think Uriah Smith missed that point, and I think that is a key to turn us away from his particular interpretation. Then it goes on to say, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. When it says he would not regard the desire of women, Uriah Smith said that is referring to the abolition of marriage as a Christian contract in revolutionary France. That was his interpretation. During the French Revolution, marriage was banned as a Christian ceremony and replaced with total civil contract. Well, we still have civil marriages today, but uh, you might say they were first introduced in revolutionary France. But the abolition of marriage as such was his interpretation. Now, the very, very few Adventists today follow Uriah Smith's interpretation on these verses. That's open secret. Anybody who knows anything about Adventist teaching today, Adventist interpretation of Daniel 11 especially, uh, don't follow Uriah Smith on this. There may be a few die-in-the-wool people who, uh, you know, still want to hang on to what he said and say that because Ellen White said his book, Thoughts on Daniel Revelation, would win souls to the end of time, therefore what he said interpreted must be right. Well, Uriah Smith's book can help to win souls because so much of what he said about the previous chapters is all very good. But I think he missed the point in this particular interpretation of verses 36 to 39. There are those, and they are by far now the majority of Adventists, who say that verse 36 to 39 is still talking about the papacy. It talks about the work of treading down the sanctuary, and then it says the king would do this and so on, and magnify himself and so on, and that fits right in with what the papacy has done. When one of the, the popes, I can give you his name if you just bear with me, Pope Leo XIII in 1878 to 1903 were his dates, said, We hold on this earth the place of God Almighty. There's big words, aren't they? Big claims. Yeah. And the Pope is called the Vicar of the Son of God. 1862, maybe even earlier. And uh, Pope Leo also said, What Jesus Christ said of himself, we may truly repeat of ourselves. That was a claim to virtual deity, you might say. And when they had a convocation or a meeting one time, one of the orators speaking to the Pope said, you are another God on earth. The Pope never jumped up and said, don't talk about that, that's blasphemy. <laughs> he just sat there and probably enjoyed the adulation that was being given to him. See. Now, because of this interpretation, that it's still the papacy being spoken of, what are they going to do with this comment about the desire of women? Well, they came up with the interpretation, many of them. These are people that are not following Uriah Smith, but following on that it's still the papacy. Said this must be a reference to the celibacy of the priests, who are not allowed to get married. Now, you all know that Catholic priests are not supposed to marry, don't you? See? But the Pope has given permission for some Dutch priests in the Catholic Church to get married. Special dispensation. And I read in the papers just recently that uh, Anglican priests who are already married, who convert to Catholicism, are allowed to keep their wives and practice as Catholic priests. And so the number of Catholic, uh, of, uh, Anglican priests that have converted to Catholicism keep their wives and are allowed to keep their wives and practice as Catholic priests. But is it really talking about the celibacy of the priesthood here? I want to put up on the, black, on the whiteboard here a look at something, what it says here. It says, 
They're not regard the desire of women. That's the first thing I've mentioned. Not regard the desire of women. What's the next thing that's mentioned? Neither regard the desire of women, nor regard any God. What comes next? Neither regard any God. Well, first of all, it says, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. I should put that one at the top, the God of the fathers. Nor the desire of women, nor any God, but would magnify self above all. <clears throat> now, when you look at these expressions in this verse, what do we see? We have here reference to deity, don't we? God of the fathers. We have here another reference to God, any God. <clears throat> We've got two references about deity. And in the middle, you have a reference about the desire of women. What's celibacy of the priesthood got to do in between two references to deity? Two references to divine being or beings. It doesn't seem to be logically in place there. So let's have a look at what this word means in the original. In the original language, the word desire is chemda. Chemda. The chemda of women. So let's look in the Bible and see what we can find where this word is used elsewhere. And if you want to have a reference or two to look at, let's have a look at uh, Daniel chapter 11. On my margin here, I've got the reference so I can refer you to it. 1 Samuel 9 verse 20. Put down the reference if you're taking notes. 1 Samuel 9, verse 20. And I won't take time to turn it and read it, but I'll tell you what it says. When King Saul was chosen as king of Israel, lots were cast. Now, he had been anointed by Samuel beforehand, so he knew it was coming, but he was a bit shy, apparently. And when the tribe of Benjamin was taken, because that was his tribe, and then the, his ancestral clan was taken, and then his father's family was taken, and then he was chosen by Lot under the guidance of God because he was the one that God had anointed through the prophet Samuel to be king when they were choosing a king. Where did they find him? Saul was hiding among the stuff, it says. All their wagons and their, the tents and all the goods and provisions and so on stored up in the campground where they were having this meeting. He was hiding somewhere. They had to hunt for him and they found him and brought him. And when they brought him before the people, what did Samuel say? In the reference that I've just told you. Behold him upon whom the desire of Israel rests. The desire of Israel. It means the one that Israel desired. The one to be king. Used of a person. Not used of a, of a relationship as, such as uh, marriage, but used of a person. The one chosen, the desired one to rule the people. That's one reference. Now, there's another text in the Bible where Chemdar is used, and this one is in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 7. Now, Haggai was one of the prophets of the restoration after Babylonian captivity. And he prophesied about things that would happen. And he was a witness, encouraging the people as they rebuilding the temple to carry on with the work and reestablishing the nation back in Palestine after they were released by Cyrus from captivity. When Cyrus took over Babylon, he let them go back to the homeland. <clears throat> and they rebuilt the temple. 
Now, the temple that they rebuilt was nowhere near as magnificent as the one that Solomon had built. Solomon had the great wealth flowing into his kingdom during his reign and built a magnificent temple. But the people building under uh, Zerubbabel and his helpers at the uh, return from Babylonian captivity were poor. They didn't have the resources. They got some help from the king's treasury, but uh, they could not afford to build up a temple that rivaled or even matched the temple of Solomon. And we're told in Scripture that some of the old men who had uh, seen the old temple, they wept. They wept when they saw the poor temple that they were able to put up when they remembered what the previous one was like. But Haggai encouraged them. And in Haggai chapter 2, you read that Haggai said to them, this temple will be more important than the one that was destroyed, than Solomon's temple, because to this temple, the desire of nations would come. You read it? The desire of nations would come. The chemdar of nations. Who is it talking about? Jesus. Jesus would come to this temple. Now the temple was later enlarged somewhat by Herod the Great so that it was a little bigger and more splendid than what Zerubbabel and his team had put up. But it was the same basic building. The original temple was still there that they had put up. And the chemdar of nations, Jesus, would come. Chemdar there is a reference to a person again, to Jesus. Now, let me ask you, if Chemdar refers to a person, what person would be the desire of women? What person would be the desire of women? What did every Jewish woman like to have been, or especially if it came from the right tribe, to be the mother of who? Jesus, the Messiah. So the Chemdar, the Chemdar of women, the one that women desire, would be a reference to Jesus. That's my understanding. And I'm not the only one that comes up with that interpretation of this word Chemdar. There are a number of other Adventist scholars that, uh, that would uh, say what I'm telling you, that it refers to Jesus. Now here's the papal power not going to regard the God of his fathers, but sets up and magnifies himself above all, would not regard Jesus, and that might sound strange, to, and some Catholics might take exception when I say that, but what have they done with Jesus? They've put him down, not any God, because... Let's look at the next verse. Look at the next verse. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Who's that? That's Mary, in my understanding. Mary becomes more of a focal point in Catholic theology at times, not always, but at times, I would say, than, than Jesus does. Do you pray, Catholics pray to Jesus? They pray to the saints and ask the saints to intercede to Mary, that Mary might intercede to Jesus because Jesus would never refuse a request from his mother. So get Mary on side and then you get your request because Jesus would never refuse his mother, the request that she makes to him. And, so, and if you know anything about what's happened in the previous Pope's administration, He wanted to make Mary the co-redemptrix of the world. Remember that? Yeah, he wanted to make her the fourth person of the Godhead. That's been in our newspapers. And that fits right in with this verse I just read, that a God whom his fathers knew not. The worship of Mary was not known before. But when the papacy came along, they brought in this idea of worship to Mary, pray to Mary. See? And I venerate and honor her, the gold and precious stones and all the things you see, a God whom his fathers knew lot. So that to me is why I disagree with Uriah Smith. Because I see this as a continuation of the papacy. And most Adventist scholars today take that position. 
the verses 36 to 39 is still talking about the papacy. And it's not the celibacy of the priesthood. It's a reference to Jesus. When we do a word study of the word chemda, we find that it refers to a person and not to an institution such as marriage. Now, we come to verse 40. And when we came to verse 40, it says, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horses and many ships. And so on. All right. Big debate has raged over many years now as to who is the king of the north and the king of the south in verse 40. You see, since the fall of the Seleucid and the Ptolemy empires and Rome coming in, there's no, mef- no reference to the king of the north or the king of the south and the rest of Daniel 11 until you get to verse 40. And suddenly it introduces them again. And so people say, well, king of the north, it must be, it must be uh, the Seleucid area. Well, who's, the, who, who's ruling over that territory today? Oh, it's Iraq, largely. Syria and Iraq, and maybe parts of even Persia, were part of the old Seleucid Empire. See? That, that must be the king of the north. And who's the king of the south? Well, it's always been Egypt, so it's got to be Egypt now. See? So, so the, the interpretation that Uriah Smith has is that Egypt is going to attack uh, uh, Turkey, because Turkey is the big power that took over that territory. But I mean, Turkey used to rule over that territory during the, the, the time before, before the First World War. Turkish uh, area was under Turkish control, virtually. But it broke up during the days of the First World War, especially with the activities of Lawrence of Arabia. And these other nations came up, Iraq and Jordan and, uh, and uh, Syria and uh, Iran. These countries got the independence and... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, League of Nations blessing and so on, and have remained virtually so since. So the, the, the Turkey, Uriah Smith says it's Turkey. Well, Turkey, of course, broke up into these other nations that I've just mentioned, and it's confined to its own territory now. But Turkey is no world power today. Neither is Egypt. Neither of them are very powerful. They're not playing big roles in history at the moment. They're not calling the tunes. Balance of power has gone elsewhere. So people try to interpret, as Uriah Smith did, by looking at the morning newspapers and they run into problems. So people have looked and said, oh, Turkey's no longer a big power, but, you know. I remember when I was a boy, my own parents told me, following Uriah Smith's interpretation, come on down here, it says, he shall plant his tabernacle, verse 45, between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. The turkey's going to come to its end. Nobody will help him. And so the belief of Adventists, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago was that Turkey would come to its end and then it says, at that time Michael shall stand up. That's the close of probation. So every Adventist was saying, watch Turkey. When Turkey collapses, probation will close. That was the interpretation that was going around in my boyhood days. My own parents believed it because it was in Uriah Smith's book. But I don't know any Adventist scholar believes it today. I don't think any Adventist scholar that I know would preach or teach that today. Because I don't think God is going to give us a sign that we can say just when probation is going to close. That's like giving a date for the second coming, which is, of course, the Bible says nobody knows. Now, I don't think God is going to give us an indication just when probation goes, because some people would be so foolish that they would wait till the last minute and then try and convert to the last minute, but then maybe the Spirit of God has already left them and it's too late. They'd miss out. Now is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Don't wait until some sign that Turkey's going to collapse before you repent. You mightn't live that long anyway. You might be hit by a bus. Or something else. Right, let's go back and look at this uh, again. Those who hold the view that it's the papacy, in verses 36 to 39, say that the power in verse 40 is still the papacy, king of the north. And in the previous study of this church, I gave you evidence 
from the book of Jeremiah and other books of the Old Testament that the reference to the north is a reference to the power that would persecute God's people. And I showed you on a map how the Jeremiah prophesied that uh, the Babylonians would come from the north. But Babylon's to the east of Jerusalem, not north, it's east. But you see, they came up the Euphrates River Valley into Syria, and down they came from the north. The Syrians came from the north. The Assyrians came from the north. The Babylonians came from the north. And when the Greeks came in, they came in from the north. And when Rome came in, they came in from the north. Oppression, the Bible said, comes from the north. So the king of the north, in the last days, I take as the power that is going to persecute God's people. And we know that it's going to be a a religio-political organization because the book of Revelation tells us that the kings of the earth are going to give their power to reign with the beast for one hour, which means a short time, in the last days as persecution against God's people breaks out. Revelation 13, neither buy nor sell if you don't have the mark of the beast. Death decree and all that. You're familiar with that, of course. And so we have here, as I see it, a synonym for the power that would be God's enemy persecuting God's people in the last days. And all the other prophecies of Daniel and the prophecies of Revelation point to that power as being the papacy, controlling most of the world, if not all the world, in the last days. Because the Revelation 13 says the whole world is going to wander after the beast. And those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, they will worship the beast and his image. I remember Pastor Burnside saying, some people when he studies with them say, I never worshipped, I never bow down to the Pope, I never worshipped the, the, the beast, I never worshipped the image of the beast. He said, if your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will. If it's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will, because the Bible says you will. And the Bible's right. Some people get the mark of the beast where? In the forehead. They're the ones that believe in it. There are going to be millions of people who don't believe it, but they get the mark because they submit to it and they get their mark in the, the hand. You see the difference? But you only get the seal of God where? In the forehead, because you have to be a believer to get the seal of God. But there'll be millions who are not believers in Catholicism. What about all the Hindus and Muslims and all the other people that don't believe in Christians, the atheists and all? They all kowtow and bow down to Rome in the last days because they won't be able to buy or sell if they don't. They get the mark in their hand, not in their forehead, because they're not believers. But you only get the seal of God in the forehead because you have to be a believer. All right, now, I want you to notice then, at the time of the end, the king of the south pushes at him. Well, if the, if the king of the north then comes against the king of the south like a whirlwind with horses and chariots and many ships and enters into the countries and overflows and passes over, enter also into the glorious land, Palestine. Many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom and Moab and chief of the children of Ammon. Egypt shall not escape, it says. This is a great war. I can't find any other interpretation but to say it is a great war. Horses and chariots and many ships, this is a war. I think this is a great war at the end of time. I'm not saying it's Armageddon. I preached in Armageddon before and told you what I believe Armageddon is. But I believe this is going to be a great struggle. And it may clear the way for Rome dominating the Western world with the aid of the United States to dominate the world in the last days. Because at the moment there are millions of people who don't acknowledge the United States and don't have much time for America. I hate America. You know, a lot of Muslims hate America today, don't they? Made the attacks. I've often wondered whether this king of the south might be a reference to the power that is competing with the king of the north for world control. Seems like that because it makes a push at the king of the north. The king of the north being the papacy controlling the western world, and here is a power that is rivaling them for control of the world. <coughs> Some people think maybe it's the Muslim world. Maybe the 9-11 attacks on America and other attacks on America has been part of the push. 
Well, America certainly responded with horses and chariots and many ships, and they sent their armies over into the Middle East and still there. Whether that is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, I do not know. Don't you go out of here and dare tell anybody that's what I'm preaching and saying. I'm saying this. I'm just watching it. Might be, but if I'm wrong, I'll be the first to admit it. Maybe something totally different, because people used to say before, communism is the king of the north. USSR is the king of the north, because they're north of Palestine. What's happened to them? The Berlin Wall came down, and the internal revolution overthrew the communist governments, even in the heartland of communism. <clears throat> now you've got a lot of capitalism in Russia today, and the mafia. Yeah, something that the West knows something about. They've got the mafia in the USSR today, in, the, in Russia, and so on. But whatever this is, is, is a, to me, a great war. And I see it as a possible way in which the papacy and Western powers will gain control of the world and then be able to enforce the mark of the beast because the power that opposes them is gone, whoever that power may be. If it's not Islam, it might be something else. He shall enter into the countries, the glorious land, overthrow Edom and Moab will escape, it says. They will be spared. Edom and Moab, of course, are no longer in existence today, but what country today is uh, covering the land that was once Edom and Moab? Anybody know? It's the land of Jordan. Jordan, the kingdom of Jordan, Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, covers the land of Edom and Moab of Bible times. And if you know anything about Middle East politics, Jordan has been a very pro-Western country for many years. Many years. I've been in Jordan two or three times and uh, did archaeological digging there some years ago. So I know a little bit about Jordan and uh, it's an interesting country. But then it says, the land of Egypt shall not escape. Verse 42 but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver. Oh, this is economic control. And what do I read about economic control? In the book of Revelation, chapter 13. Don't we believe that the book of Revelation is an expansion of the book of Daniel? I do. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, it says, if you don't have the mark of the beast, you will not be able to buy or sell. Economic boycott. And here it says, this power will have control over the silver of gold and over the treasuries and so on. And the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. I see here, this is the first reference of the coming boycott against those that have the seal of God in the last days. Expanded in more detail in Revelation 13. Control, papacy and the image of the beast. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. What, what is that, tidings out of the east and the north? Well, if he's the king of the north, tidings out of the north could be tidings, tidings from his own ranks, from within his own, the, own, the organization of the papal-dominated world. What tidings from his own ranks might trouble the beast power? Well, it may be when the latter rain is falling out and thousands of people are leaving the apostate churches and joining with God's people. That would trouble him. And tidings out of the east? What would that be? Well, the word east, you know, is an interesting word in the Bible. And I've given you some study on that, I think, before. And I talked with uh, Armageddon, the kings of the east. In the Greek, the east is Antole, uh, and from which in English we get Antolia, which refers to uh, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, Turkey and so on, Antolia. So tidings out of the east, well we are, we are called the kings and priests of God and the the Bible prophesies about the kings of the east having their way prepared to the battle of Armageddon. I've studied that with you here before. So the tidings from the east could well be tidings from within God's church. 
because we are the kings and priests of God. Revelation tells us that. And so tidings from God's church troubles the beast power. And tidings from within his own ranks trouble him. As thousands and thousands of people heed the call, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes in Revelation 18, to come out of her, my people, they come and join us under the power of the latter rain that I talked about this morning, that will certainly trouble the papacy. But you'd think they're beginning to lose control, but as thousands of people withdraw their support and join up with God's people. And what effect does this news, this tidings, have on this power? Read the rest of the verse. Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore shall he go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Revelation 13, I believe, calls that the death decree. See how it all fits together? Death decree. If you don't have the mark of the beast, you're going to be killed, they say. Do away many. Destroy. The great fury. Because the latter rain is falling. God's final call is being given. And the opposition of Satan stirs up against God's people to the point of wanting to execute all those that refuse to get the mark of the beast. See? And then he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. All right. Uh, this is when the papacy comes to its end. In the book of Revelation, I read about that too. It says, God has put it into the hearts of the kings of the earth in the last days to turn on the papacy and rend her and burn her with fire. I'm quoting Revelation. When they realize that they have been supporting and backing a false system and that their own salvation now has been forfeited and that they are doomed, they turn on the papacy and they rend her with fire and destroy her. I see this as a fulfillment of that. If you come to his end, none shall help him. There are three or four. You go through the other prophecies of Revelation. Uh, uh, sorry, the other prophecies of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, you have the image being ground into powder and blowing away in the wind, coming to its end. Daniel chapter 7, what do you have? Judgment shall shit and shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it to the end. Daniel chapter uh, uh, 9 which is part of 8 and 9 prophecy. What does it say in the last verse? Last part of the last verse. He shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the, uh, the spreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, that is the end. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That's King James. The margin gives a better reading. It says, the desolator. The desolator. And that is, the power that has been desolating will be self be desolated, come to its end. So here, after prophecy, after prophecy, after prophecy, and in the book of Revelation, you have it again, there is a picture of the persecuting power against God's people is going to come to its end and ultimately be destroyed. Revelation pictures being cast into the lake of fire. And some people wonder, well, what's the lake of fire? Is at the end of the millennium? But there's a lake of fire before the end of the millennium. There's a lake of fire at the beginning of the millennium. And James White once was asked about that. And James White said, yeah, there's a lake of fire both ends of the millennium. Beginning and end. The beast is to be cast in the lake of fire at the second coming of Jesus. After all, don't we read in Revelation, uh, sorry, in Thessalonians, that uh, the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his coming. The glory of the coming of the second coming will be like fire to the wicked. They'll be destroyed by it and the papacy included in that destruction. And he comes to his end and nobody can help him. Now we've mentioned about the, um, the um, latter rain this morning and I've mentioned about that this afternoon also. I want to turn now to Revelation 18. Revelation chapter 18. You notice that I'm jumping over a lot of pages here because I've just got ahead of my notes because I'm just talking it from what's in my mind rather than reading it verse by verse from my notes, which is uh, perhaps a little bit uh, more boring for you. But let's come over to, uh, to um, 
Revelation chapter 18. Here we are. Open your Bibles to this chapter. A very important chapter. Revelation chapter 18. We Adventists have preached about Revelation 12, 13, and 14 a lot. But we mustn't overlook Revelation 18. Revelation 16, of course, and 17, they're important chapters. I want to look at Revelation 18 the rest of the time we have together this afternoon. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. Now the three angels' messages have been going. Revelation 14, the hour of his judgment is come. We preach that as Adventists in 1844. October 22, Jesus began a work of pre-Advent or investigative judgment. that has been going on and still going on today, we believe. And this is worship him that made heaven and earth. How can you worship God as the creator? Obviously by observing the memorial that he gave us of his creation, which is the Sabbath day. So there's the Sabbath and the judgment message going together in Revelation 14. See? And then comes the warning against the um, apostasy of Babylon in the second angel's message. So the first angel is a message about the true religion. The second angel's message is a warning against the false religion. And the third angel is a message to show you how do you tell the difference between the two. And the test is the mark of the beast. The false Sabbath versus the true Sabbath. The third angel's message. And the worst curse ever found in the Bible anywhere is the one in Revelation 14 dealing with the third angel's message. No curse in the Bible worse than that. And that message of coming out of her, my people, of course, has been going on. But now in Revelation chapter 18, another angel comes down from heaven, not with a different message, but with a similar message. And what does he cry? He cries mightily, because this is with the latter rain power. We talked about this morning. He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Become the habitation of devils. The hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Babylon has fallen spiritually. False religion has fallen so far away from God's truth that the Bible says it's a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Strong language, isn't it? And then verse 3 talks about the persecution that uh, will be seen. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of fornication. The kings of the earth committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another angel, another voice rather from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup to which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she said in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and shall see no more, uh, sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning. And famine, she shall be utterly burned with fire. There, the lake of fire at the second coming. See? For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Now, this committing of fornication with the kings of the earth is a biblical reference to church-state union, which God condemns. Whenever in the Bible you have church and state united, you end up with persecution against those that dissent. Thank God we live in a country where church and state are separate. It's a real blessing. And I feel sorry for those people that don't have the privileges and the blessings that we have in this country. But things are going to change because the whole world is going to wander after the beast and the seal of God and the mark of the beast test will be a worldwide test before the end. And persecution will come here, as we read in Revelation 13, neither buy nor sell and eventually death decree. And I've studied the death decree with you before. So here's a picture of this church-state union. When the merchants of the earth have waxed rich the abundance of her delicacies, you know, if you wanted to paraphrase that into modern language, you could probably say the multinational, multinationals have waxed rich through their trade. Some people are making money today. I'm not among them. <laughs> and I don't know anybody in, 
in my hearing of my voice this afternoon that's making themselves rich in these last days. Some of us you know, have to be careful what we spend our money on. You know, it's a bit of a hand-to-mouth existence sometimes, especially when you get the bills coming in the way they do, power bills, rate bills, insurance bills, and transport bills, and all other kind of bills, and food and so on as well, and clothing. You know, we, we thank God we live in a country where we're not destitute, but uh, you know, some people are making millions. Merchants of the earth, it says, are waxed rich through the abundance of their delicacies. So here is a spiritual fall in Revelation 18. A spiritual fall a, because of apostasy, turning away from God's truth. Babylon has fallen, and God gives his final call when the latter rain is poured out, the loud cry is given, Come out of her, my people, that you do not experience or suffer her plagues, because they're coming. Revelation 16 describes them for us. Terrible plagues. And Ellawise says they are the most terrible scourges this world has ever seen. Don't let anybody tell you that they're figurative, allegorical. One well known name in this part of the world has preached, and I've heard him. I've heard him say it. Seven last plagues are not real. Uh, plague number two, salt water turned to blood. That means wickedness in the world. Plague number three, salt water, uh, fresh water turned to blood. That is wickedness in the church in the last days. Sun given power to scorch men with great heat, he said. That's uh, persecution against the church in the last days. Not literal heat. Well, according to my understanding, the seven last plagues are put out on those that have the mark of the beast. And he, he, this man had plague number four falling on the church. How did that happen? Is that logical? And Psalm 91 says, No plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. God's people are to be protected when the plagues fall. This person was saying, Plague number four is persecution on the church. So the church is suffering the plague. How come? Church is supposed to be protected from the plagues. Okay. And he never seemed to realize what he was saying. I don't think to this day he ever realized what he's saying. I've heard him say it. A spiritual fall. But there's another fall mentioned in this chapter. And I want to spend a few minutes on that before we close. Come with me, Revelation 18, verse 10. Well, Verse, verse 9, start. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off. For the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, for that great city, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Now, they're not lamenting about a spiritual fall. That's in the earlier part of the chapter. This is something different now. Notice what it says. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. This is economic collapse now. Merchandise is no longer being bought and sold. Economic collapse. Then it goes on to say, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and the pearls and fine linen. I'm reading verse 12. And purple and silk and scarlet and all fine mine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, souls of men, TVs, Mobile phones, iPods, jet aeroplanes, Holden motor car. Oh, am I reading something into the text? Yes, I'm reading something in that's not there. But you get the picture, don't you? Some of these things were not things that we're particularly buying and selling today. At least most of us wouldn't be buying a lot of gold and silver and precious stones. We don't have the money to buy that stuff. But 
other things that we are selling today. He lists here the things that people were trading and selling back in his day, John's day. We could add, to get the picture complete, the things that we buy and sell that people are trading today. That's what I tried to do. See? But here is total economic collapse. It's coming. It's going to hit the world one day and there's going to be a lot of men, as the Bible says, the rich men will be weeping and wailing because of the riches have come to naught. Total economic collapse. Now, let me share something with you. This material that I got from my computer, people sent me emails and things, and a lot of this is on the computer if you want to go and use Google to search for it. Did you know that in 1971, how many years ago is that? 42 years ago. Alan Greenspan, you ever heard that name? Outstanding American man in charge of the Federal Reserve. He was then chairman of the Federal Reserve. Told the nation, 41, 42 years ago, he told the nation that the United States is officially bankrupt. Officially bankrupt. In 1972, he stated that since he saw no improvement in about 30 years, the U.S. would financially collapse. And maybe it'll happen sooner than that. By the way, many don't know that the Federal Reserve Bank is not a government entity. It is owned by a group of the world's largest banks. It basically controls all the money. The federal government borrows a lot of money from this entity. Guess who makes a lot of money off the interest? The banks, they seem to be able to make money all the time, don't they? Did you know that the Bill of Rights has been essentially abolished since 9-11? Any person can now legally be detained, arrested, tortured and executed without being charged or told why. This was approved by Congress, the President and the Vice President. Since 9-11, a lot of individual rights and freedoms in the United States have disappeared. The U.S. has reached the point where 98% of the taxes collected by the government, 98% of the money they take in in their taxes, you know what it's used for? No, not for the army to pay for the military campaigns that they're waging in Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan or wherever else. But it's used, 98% it says here is used to pay the interest on the debt. Trying to run the country on 2% of their tax take? No country in the world can do that. Run a whole nation to pay all the wages of their congressmen and all the military expense and costs and so on, on 2% of what they collect in taxes, 98% going to pay the interest? You see why America is virtually bankrupt? So started, so uh, starting in February 2006, the US decided to print all the money that it needed, which is financial suicide. It is estimated, I, read, I can't read it all to you, I haven't got time, I've got other things to share with you. It is estimated that the US has two to two and a half years before financial collapse. And this is, this is I got this back in um, 2008. We've had a global meltdown since then, haven't we? And then the US passed a law, and America almost went uh, to the wall financially. And at the last minute, the Congress approved a bill to allow the government to borrow a whole lot millions and millions and millions, billions, billions more to uh, otherwise they would default on their payment of their bills. Yeah, if you've got a US Treasury bill, you can go to the, pay, cash it in and get your money back. But when the America goes to the war, you go to pay, you cash your Treasury bill for that you've lent the government money and the government hasn't got money to pay you back. You go bankrupt. That's what bankruptcy is. You don't have any cash. 
Estimated that the US would collapse in two to two and a half years. Remember, this forecast is from the spring of 2006. That's six years ago. The world knows that the US goes down, the whole world will go down, because that is what global economy will happen, or would do. Everything is connected, and other countries of the world are warning their people. In the spring of 2008, a report from Europe, it may be from the same French organization, forecast September 2008, collapse of the US economy. When this happens, every business bank and state will close. Ah. Financially, it says the US has already committed suicide. The people just don't know it yet. But when they learn, the collapse will make the Great Depression, that is 1929, look like a minor recession. This would call global collapse and contribute to the desperation that will lead to the Sunday law. But it is inevitable and will be soon. Again, God decides, but unless there is a crisis, our sleeping church in the modern societies of the world will not wake up. All right. Uh, here's a little interesting note. A certain Adventist pastor is traveling in Bohe Bolivia, the stand in South America. He travels internationally, which enables him to get a whole lot of information not readily available in the U.S., Hence the cutting edge into uh, cutting edge information on the, on the website. The Bolivian airport he was uh, the Bolivian airport he was at will no longer accept U.S. dollar bills. Even the money changers won't accept U.S. dollars. They told him, "None of us want to be caught dead holding U.S. dollars." Well, that's, that's uh, back in 1900 and, uh, what did I say, 8, 7, uh, 19, uh, 28, 2008. Let me tell you, I went to the Middle East in 19, 1990, oh, when was it, 1997. No, it was bef before that. The Hezbollah dig, 1973, I think it was 1973. And because of the situation then, American dollars were going down, down, down the gurgle, as we say. Down in value. I decided to take Deutschmarks. So I went to the bank and asked for my traveler's checks to be issued to me in Deutschmarks. Because they were holding their value better at that time than what the US dollar was. The US dollar was sliding. And so I got Deutschmarks. All right, I cashed some Deutschmarks in Egypt. When I was leaving Egypt, I tried to change my money back into Deutschmarks, the unspent Egyptian money. I wanted to change it back into Deutschmarks as I left Egypt. And they would not give me Deutschmarks at the airport. They said, you take US dollars. I said, I don't want US dollars. This was back in 1973, 40 years ago. I don't want US dollars. I did not bring US dollars. I brought Deutschmarks. I want my money changed back into Deutschmarks. No, you're not getting Deutschmarks. You take US dollars or you get nothing. That was their attitude. Made me angry, but I had to take US dollars because, uh, you know, the value was down. But that, that's years ago. That's 40 years ago. Let me read you something else here. If the government taxed every American every American's personal income, 100%. In other words, if they took your whole pay, all of your pay, every payday, and every corporate business income at 100% right now, we are now past the point that we would pay off our current national debt. The national debt of America is so big that if they took all the income of all the American citizens of the whole nation, it wouldn't pay off the debt. In simple terms, it is now impossible for America to pay off its national debt. This does not include Medicare or Social Security, which is an additional $78 trillion in debt currently. This is just the national debt of the federal government. In more simple terms, if all the money all Americans made was given 100% to the government, it would never pay back the debt. 
And then, most of the states of the 50 states that constitute the United States, most of them are also in debt. I'm just talking about the national government debt. The state governments are also in debt. Millions, millions, billions of dollars. With the current tax revenue, a revenue, with the current tax revenue coming in from every source possible in the United States of America, it is now past the point of being able to even pay the interest on the debt each month. In other words, all the tax revenue from all the people and businesses collected each month cannot pay the interest that they're owing. So the interest is just adding to the debt. The US now owes money, more money, to other countries than any other country in the world. 46 of the 50 states are also in debt. Here it is, $160 billion. They're in debt. Out of tens of thousands of companies, only four US companies have a AAA rating. Only four companies have a AAA rating, credit rating. Four years ago, there were 4,300 of them that had a AAA rating. All right, 42 million Americans are on food stamps. 42 million Americans are eating because the government gives them food stamps that they can cash for food. 13% of the population, that is. 43% of Americans have spent more than they earned this past year, so they're going into debt too. Individuals. Personal bankruptcy has doubled in the last two years. America now has the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Ah. The US dollar is over. The ramifications of this will be enormous. I don't know how long it will take, but it will happen. I am now sure of it. I thought the incoming conservative people elected would have a chance to turn it around, but I don't see any indications of it. Well, what does the Bible say? No man buys the merchandise anymore. America is going into debt at the rate of millions, if not billions, every month. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The richest nation in the world cannot go on indefinitely like that. Even the Australian government, I heard the other day, is borrowing $100 million every so often to survive here because we've got debt. The economic collapse is coming. There it is in Revelation 18. No man buys their merchandise anymore. So we are plenty of evidence to show we are living in the last days. The world is in a mess. Financially, it's in a mess. And, and Congress won't raise taxes because the, the rich won't, don't want to pay any more taxes, and so they lobby and block the government from... Don't pay, don't raise taxes, or, you know. So America is not... They're talking about reducing taxes. Reducing taxes when they're in the financial state they're in? It's financial suicide. And that's the mess that the world is in. Aren't you glad there's a bit of day coming for this world? That's when the Lord will come Amen. and establish his everlasting government and uh, so on. You know, <clears throat> Ellen White told us years ago we should shun debt like the poison. Yes. But I wish that some of the politicians had heeded her advice because the world is in a mess. But that's what God's word says. No man buys her merchandise anymore. It's coming. How soon it's going to come, I don't know. But we surely must be living in getting very close to the coming of the Lord, closer than perhaps some of us realize. We sometimes think, oh, there's so many things that have got to happen yet, you know, so many of the signs have got to go. But. Uh, it's a sobering thought when you consider what the mess the world is in now. Revelation 18 pictures it for us. May God help us all that we will be on the Lord's side, make sure our names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, and keep them there by being loyal to that which we know is his truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have been considering serious things this afternoon about the condition of the world. These are all signs that Jesus is going to come. We don't know how soon it's going to be, but we don't know how soon total collapse is going to come either. But one of these days it, uh, it will happen the way things are turning out. If a country can't even pay the interest on the money that they've now borrowed, however they're going to get out of the mess. The only thing that will solve the problems of the world is for Jesus to come. 
keep us true and faithful to that day that we may share in the wonderful new future that he is planning for all those that love him is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.